Well, thank you for coming out on a, on a Saturday afternoon. And on behalf of Abraham Lincoln and Mary Lincoln, welcome. And we've got a, we have today, we have a three-part series on, on Lincoln. And we have an awful lot to, you know, to chat about in, in just a three-part series. So what, I, what I'll do here is I will you know, kind of pick and choose as to, you know, what, you know, what topics that we, 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 we dive into. And when we do, we're going to take a deep dive into certain aspects of the, of the Lincoln presidency. And I guess the best place to begin, that's always the best place to begin, is to begin at the beginning. So what, I, what I'd like to do is, 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 is to bring everybody to the, to the Republican National Convention in, in Illinois, in Chicago, in, in 1860, to begin there. And, and, and over time, we'll talk about Lincoln's relationship with Mary and his generals and the, you know, the origin of the, of, the, of the Emancipation Proclamation in January of 1863. That's where I'd like to get to this afternoon. So, so put on your Lincoln seatbelts. And, uh, and I'm from the land of Lincoln, by the way. That's why I carry $5 bills. I'm from the land of Lincoln and the... And I'll tell you what, what captured my, my attention about Lincoln is that my grandmother insisted, and I, th I mean, she was, she insisted, you know, that she remembers on Memorial Day or, or maybe Flag Day or one of those days that the veterans from the Civil War, you know, would come to the school and visit the school. And the little girls, it's hard to imagine her as a little girl. I mean, it really is when you look at those photographs. But as a little girl, she had a memory that they would give flowers to these veterans. And I always thought that she was hallucinating, you know, that uh, she was making it up. So I did the birthday deal, and, I, and I, I dealt with the beginning and the end of the war. And yes, that's entirely possible that she would have been young enough and these men would have been old, at least in her eyes. They would have been old men, you know, in the 70s and, and 80s, but it worked. You know, it worked chronologically, so I believe her. And I still do. And, and, that, and that began to uh, kind of interest me in, in the Civil War. And of course, being from the land of Lincoln certainly you know, reaffirmed that. So, so let, let's begin. Let's begin in, in 1860 at the, at, at the Republican National Convention in 1860. Uh, it was the brand new convention set. It was called the Wigwam. It's on the prairie, the Wigwam. It's not there today. And it was brand new, and the Republican Party had made a decision, as, the, as all political parties do for the upcoming convention, that cities bid on the convention. There's money, isn't there? Delegates spend money. Uh, networks spend money. And, the, and the, the owners of the wigwam had petitioned the Republican Party to hold their national convention in, in Chicago, in the brand new wigwam. And I'm sure we'll get your rates on rooms. We'll get your coupons for... For, uh, for, for restaurants, and, 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 and all of that went into the package. And the reason the Republican Party bit on the offer from Illinois, from Chicago, is that the party leaders had, had biopsied the, the election of 1856. Now, why do I mention the election of 1856? It's the first time that the Republican Party ran a national ticket in 1856, right out of the cellophane wrapper for the very first time in 1856. And they got beat. Uh, they, got, they got beat by the Democrat, James Buchanan. But in that defeat, uh, there, was, there was good news in that defeat. There was a silver lining. And the silver lining was this, and this ties us right back to Chicago. As the leaders of the Republican Party looked at the results, and one of the founders of the Republican Party was William Seward of New York, as they looked at the results, the electoral breakdown jumped out at them. If in the next election, 1860, if in the next, this, this sounds so modern, doesn't it? If in the next election we can hold our base, the 11 states that we carried in 1856, if we can hold our base and then plus add to that base Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania was in their minds in play, Buchanan was from Pennsylvania. And Buchanan had been elected, as I said, in 1856. And in the inaugural, and one never does, never, you should never do this, that he announced he was going to be a one-term president. 
I'm not going to seek re-election. And he's just been sworn in. You never do that. You lose all your, all your muscle, all your political muscle. So that is going, for the Republican Party, that's going to put Pennsylvania in play, and plus Pennsylvania, and then plus, plus, if we can add to our base, plus Pennsylvania, and then add either Indiana or Illinois, we can win the whole thing. We can win the whole thing without having to gain a single electoral vote among the slave states. Now those were the numbers they're dealing with. And here comes the, the bid from Chicago. We've got a brand new convention center. Come on down. And, and the party knew the name Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln was not a, a household word, but he certainly was known among Republican leaders. And he certainly was known across the state of Illinois. I mean, after all, he had had that, those very famous and well covered in the Eastern press, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which, which were in 1857. So there's so much that begins to, you know, feed into this. And Lincoln, and, and Lincoln is not at Chicago. He's back home in Springfield with Mary. And, you know, as he mentioned to her and to any who would listen about the nomination, and these are his words, frontier words, if you will, the taste is in my mouth a little bit. And, and maybe I can be everybody's second choice. By, and he knew that coming into Chicago, the, the anticipated nominee, one of the founders, was William Seward of New York, Senator Seward, a devoted abolitionist. And Seward had money, he had deep pockets, a founding father, as I said, and he showed up with a bushel basket full of pledged delegates. He didn't need too many to go over the top. Lincoln had many supporters, and they were called Wide Awakes. That's just their nickname, Wide Awakes. Wide Awake for Lincoln. If there's an opportunity, why, if there's an opportunity here, if we, can, if we can get some dirt on Seward, what a surprise, huh? Negative politicking. If we can dig something up on Seward. And so, combing through his speeches, combing through Seward's speeches, they found a phrase, Brockton, they found a phrase that Seward wished I had never said. And the phrase was, and he said this a few years earlier, you know, in a, in a speech, we all let things fall out of our mouths sometimes, don't we? Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the growing tension in the country between the North and the South over so many issues, that Seward said, I see, I, I see what he called an irrepressible conflict coming. Now, he didn't mean, he didn't define what that conflict would be, but he used the phrase irrepressible conflict. Mm -hmm. And the wide awake seized on that, and they interpreted it as meaning war is coming. And the question that they put, you know, to the delegates, those who remained uncommitted, Seward did not get the nomination on the first ballot. It was going to a, a second ballot. And the wide awakes began to move among the delegates. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And here it is, that do we want to nominate a man? The situation is tense enough. Do we want to nominate a man who has said that he sees a, an irrepressible conflict coming? Do we want to nominate a man who is perhaps already conditioning himself and the nation for war? Do we want to really do that? The situation is tense enough. Do we want that? And as all civil wars are, they're, they're bloody and fierce and split families and they split communities, don't they? Do we want to take a chance? We can win this thing all. We can win the whole thing. But maybe not with Seward. And when Seward didn't make it on the first ballot, he knew it was out there. And he could feel his support slipping away. And on the second ballot, he offered Lincoln the vice presidency. And Lincoln, the taste is in my mouth a bit. And perhaps I can surface as everyone's second choice. And oftentimes, if there's tension at the top, that you're in a better position to be everyone's second choice as a compromise candidate. And what the Lincoln people did, they did two things. They, they went around to the various state delegations and they promised cabinet positions. Now, Lincoln had made it clear, don't, don't give anything away, don't promise any positions. And I'm sure he said, sotto voce, do what you need to do. So moving among the Pennsylvania delegation, the Ohio de delegation, the, the New York delegation, 
offering positions, offering patronage, offering cabinet spots. And of Pennsylvania, it was the, uh, the Cameron, Cameron family, very popular, and he wanted to be Secretary of War because of all the graft that might be available if we do get into a military conflict. And Lincoln had to fire the guy eventually. I mean, uh, as people would say about him, the only reason he wouldn't, f he, he wouldn't steal a stove is because it might be hot. All uh, right. Uh, so um, this is the kind of guy. And Lincoln, Lincoln was a shrewd man. Don't promise anything. Promise everything. Just don't tell me about it. So the wide awakes are moving among the delegates. And they're, they're passing the news about this irrepressible conflict. And what they've also done is they have printed up, they, they have counterfeited hundreds of delicate badges, lanyards, to be able to get into the convention and to be able to cheer and to be able to, Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. So when Lincoln turned down the VP job in, on the second ballot, on that third ballot, these wide awakes, they had packed the galleries and Lincoln's name is put in nomination. And the delegates sitting on the floor and the, and the galleries just erupt. You know, Lincoln, 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 Lincoln. The whole place is shaking and rocking. Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln. And he goes over the top on the third ballot. And he runs with the Hannibal Hamlin. When's the last time you heard that name? Mm -hmm. Hannibal Hamlin of, of Maine. I mean, there is, a, there is a Hamlin, Maine. I think it has a grocery store a filling station, and maybe a stop sign. So he runs with Hannibal Ham on a, of Maine. And, and Lincoln, Lincoln's position on slavery, just a word about that because we're going to roll back to this repeatedly. Lincoln personally abhorred slavery, absolutely abhorred it. It, it offended his sense of morality to own people, to own people, to steal their labor, to steal their future. Now, Lincoln did not believe in the social equality of blacks and whites at all. Um, but he did believe in the economic equality and the right of someone to work. And they had their work, they had their, 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 their labor to sell and to keep the product and the sweat of their labor. That's Lincoln's position personally, morally. The position of the Republican Party, and this was right in the platform, and Lincoln supported this, that, we are to, that Lincoln was never an abolitionist, never at least not in 1860. We won't get all there today, this afternoon. But, but the position of the Republican Party on slavery, and hear me well here, that it was to contain slavery, contain it to the 15 slave states. And we tend to forget that, we tend to forget that even in Philadelphia when they drafted the Constitution, and you know, I always have a copy somewhere, right? I have it close by. When they drafted the Constitution, the word slavery does not appear. Uh, it was there. They were sensitive to the word slavery. So there were euphemisms for slavery. Uh, people bound to labor, people bound to servitude. And everybody knew that was a code word for slavery. And, and, and I mean, half the delegates of Philadelphia were slaveholders anyway. And the word slavery does not appear. And I'm going to tip my hand here because this is a, I think, an interesting factoid. The only time the word, the only time that the word slavery ever appeared in the Constitution was in 1865, the 13th Amendment, where it mentioned the abolition of slavery. So that's an interesting takeaway, by the way. And that's for you this afternoon. The only time that's mentioned is when it's abolished, you know, by the 13th Amendment. Uh, the word democracy does not appear in the Constitution at all. And nor does, the word, nor does the word slavery. The position of the Republican Party, to contain it to the 15 slave states. And that over time, the hope was, or the prediction was, that over time, that slavery would wither on the vine. And that state by state, slave state by slave state, that there would be a snowball effect of the states, slave states, abolishing slavery. And Lincoln believed that Virginia would be the first one in the, in the border states, in, in, the border, in, in the border slave states of Virginia, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, that slavery, the profitability of slavery was on decline. And that, and that one by one, and this would be a state's rights decision, not imposed by the federal government, 
that the states would have ownership of that decision. And like most things in life, when you have ownership of a decision, it's easier to make, isn't it? When you make it, that you're not pushed into it, that it's, it's authentic, you've made it. And this is Lincoln. We're going to contain slavery, not allow it to expand into the territories, and over time a number of things would happen that would, that would bring about its withering on the vine, that uh, the, the morals of the country would begin to improve, that slavery indeed, it's wrong to own people, and it's sinful perhaps even to own people, but more importantly, free labor is far more productive than slave labor. And it would take time for that to happen. And Lincoln was asked, well, how long do you think? And he said, I really don't know, but I, my guess would be, and this is Lincoln, sometime in the early 20th century that perhaps we would have the, fi the final end to slavery in the deep south, the Mississippi or in Alabama. So he's looking at the long view here over time. It's not the role of the federal government. It's not my role as president to impose my will and my beliefs on the American people. They need to decide. The, the residents of the slave states need to decide for the reasons I've just laid out for you. And, and, Link, and Lincoln, Lincoln wins. He, and, and Lincoln clearly in, in 1861, when he takes office in March of 1861, that Lincoln is a sectional president. He does not earn, he does not gather up a single electoral vote in the, in the slave states. That he needed, you know, he needed 152 electoral votes to carry the election. And he got something like, he got 180. And they all came from the northern states. Now what happened to the Democratic Party on that 1860 election? chaos, division, uh, schism. The, the Democratic Party in 1860, they, they divided. They split. At the convention, they split. The, uh, the northern wing of the Democratic Party nominated Stephen Douglas of Illinois. The southern wing of the Democratic Party nominated John Breckinridge of Kentucky, slaveholder. So the issue of slavery and the question of whether or not we ought to leave the Union you know, divided the Democratic Party. And there were two conventions. The first convention broke up in almost what we would, a, 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 a fight, you know, a bar fight. And so we have two nominees from the Democratic Party. And then we have a, and we have a third party running as well. And that's the Constitutional Union Party. And that's John Bell, you know, John Bell of Tennessee and, and Edward Everett of, of Massachusetts who was a well-known name in Massachusetts. And by the way, I'll mention it now and I'll revisit this, it will be Edward Everett of Massachusetts who will be invited to Gettysburg in November of 1863 to deliver the Gettysburg Address. If you look at the program for the day, next to the name Gettysburg, next to the phrase Gettysburg Address is Ed Everett of Massachusetts. He was a well-known public speaker and he knew, the folks knew he would, give the, he would give those families who would come to dedicate this national cemetery, that he would give them a stem winder of a speech, that he would go on for two, two and a half hours. And that's what people expected, two, two and a half hours. Speechifying politics was entertainment. I'll come back to that, not today, but later on when I see you when? In November, right? When I see you in November. So Lincoln, Lincoln is, a sectional president. The Democratic Party is split. We have another party, the Constitutional Union Party, and, and the press descends on, on, on the Springfield home, and, and, and Mary, Mary is interviewed. See, Mary was very political, and she wanted success for, for Abraham Lincoln, and her politics, you know, did, did not trump, if you will, her love for Lincoln, but she pushed him. She wanted to be first lady. And, 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 and when she arrived in Washington, the Washington social elite, the, the Green Book, you know, where all the big shots are and all the ladies, um, they, this, this woman from the frontier, I'll bet you she doesn't have any teeth. I'll bet you she's chewing tobacco when she gets off the, when she gets off the train. I'll bet you this is the first time she's ever worn shoes. You know, and, and Mary Lincoln was none of that. She was a urbane, cosmopolitan, well-educated, well-spoken, well-read 
woman who was ambitious, ambitious for herself, for her husband, and also had some real medical problems that uh, went I, undiagnosed because nobody knew how to die, how, that they even were a problem. So we'll get to that later on. The inaugural was in March of 1861. Back then they were in March, not January. And with Lincoln's election, the seven states bolted the Union. They did not even want to wait for Lincoln to be properly sworn in. We don't believe he's going to lie. He's going to lie about his, about his position on slavery in the inaugural. He has a Republican majority in both the House and the Senate, and he's going to work his mischief. He's going to work his evil ways on us. Now that he is, as the word was, he is Abraham Afrikanus. Abraham Afrikanus. Look at his build. Look how slim he is. Look at his build. Look at the color of his skin. He's dark. Someone jumped the fence in that family years ago. He's dark. He's skinny. He's got long fingers like an NBA shooter. He's got asparagus fingers and asparagus toes. He's Abraham Afrikanus. He lies. He is going to he is going to request from Congress that they abolish slavery. So we are going to, and this led by South Carolina. South Carolina is the first state to bolt, and they're joined by six other states. And we have the formation of the Confederate States of America in its first capital, Montgomery, Montgomery, Alabama, and Jefferson Davis, president, Alexander Stevens of Georgia, vice president. You know, it's interesting that in both Lincoln and Jefferson Davis hailed from the same state. In other words, they were born in Kentucky. They just went west, south. And a Congress, an army, they dispatched ambassadors abroad to gain diplomatic recognition. That was so important because diplomatic recognition implies sovereignty. It implies the exchange of ambassadors, credentials, and perhaps loans, perhaps if there is war, army, navy, gold, just as our, our, gener our, our grandfathers need the support of France to wiggle away from Great Britain. And we, we may need the support of, of England to be able to wiggle away from the United States of America. After all, our, our, our ace in the hole here is the British textile industry. Cotton, 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 cotton is king. When we I need to go to the document. You with me? This is a small primer, isn't it? This is a small primer. It's a small document with a big voice. And so we've got seven states out of the Union in February. They don't even want to listen to Lincoln's lies in the inaugural. And that from their point of view, and they're right, and there's an argument to be made here, that secession was legal to leave the Union. Secession is legal. You know, that our grandfathers, our grandfathers, state by state, ratified the Constitution, state by state by state. And, and what we are doing now, you know, we are going to decertify our membership in that club that our grandfathers created in 1787, 1788. We are simply leaving. And, and they're, pardon me, they're right on this point. But Lincoln, a clever court, courthouse lawyer, is going to rebut, refute, that there is no language in the Constitution that prohibits secession. No language at all. And silence is consent. That's why when we're at a meeting and the chair asks, are there any objections? And there's no objection, the motion carries unanimously. Silence is consent. There is no language to prevent us from leaving. This is not the union that our grandfathers created in 1787. We feel threatened. Our way of life, our economy, our way of life is threatened by these howling abolitionists who are always in a minority, by the way, uh, but they also are at the top of their voice. And the more noise we make, the more confusion we can cause. And, and Lincoln, I'm not an abolitionist. They didn't believe him. And in that inaugural address, Lincoln will address the logic of secession. And if we look at that inaugural address, and imagine, imagine, I mean, the, the whole nation is listening 
the, the union is broken. And, and, Lincoln, and Lincoln, in that, in that inaugural address, he offering carrots and sticks, you know, carrots and sticks. I, oftentimes you need to explain to young men and women what that means, you know, carrots and sticks. And Lincoln, you know, Lincoln, the carrot, the carrots, you know, that I am not going to recommend that slavery be abolished. I stand by the position, the plank of the Republican Party, to contain it, to contain it. I'm not Abraham Africanus. He didn't say that in the inaugural, but that's the position of the Republican Party. I will not attack you, and I will make sure that the trains run and that the mail is delivered. And I will enforce, even though he disagreed personally with it, I will enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act had been on the books since 1850, and what that act did it put the federal government in the business of helping slave catchers track down their slaves who had fled into a New York or into Massachusetts. And Lincoln, I will enforce that. There will be no war. Only you can bring about a war. Now the carrots, not rather the sticks. I've been lawfully elected. I am, you may not like it. Sounds familiar again, huh? You may not like it. You know, but I'm a lawfully elected president. And you can vote me out of office in 1864. I've just taken an oath to, to my God. Now, Lincoln was not a very religious man, but that's good cover. I mean, that, that's good cover in this country to invoke the Lord or, or to invoke whatever. It's always good political cover. And, and Lincoln, Lincoln, I've just taken an oath to, to my God, our God, the nation's God, to preserve, and preserve protect, and defend the Union. And secession is unlawful, it's unconstitutional. The framers never, ever, the reason there's no language in here for secession of leaving, because the framers would never have anticipated anyone wishing to leave the Union. What a deal you've got here. What a deal. Who would ever walk out on me? Who would walk out on the Union? And, and, and how do I know that? I know that because there's language here they did take the time to write, to write up language by which a territory can evolve into a state. And it's right there. They saw the nation as growing and growing, not contracting. And there's language to grow. There is no language to contract because we will never be diminished. We will remain the United States of America rather than the disunited States of America. So yes, I agree with you, so stipulated. There's no language because the framers, ne your grandfathers never expected anyone would want to leave. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to make sure the mails are delivered and I'm going to make sure the, that the, the trains run. And he wasn't clear about what he meant by this. I am going to protect and defend federal property. He didn't spell out what that was, how he would do it, or where it would be. And you know, Washington was brimming, brimming hot with rumors that Lincoln would be gunned down, shot, assassinated, making his inaugural address. And you see, I mean, back then, I mean, Lincoln, uh, Lincoln had a voice like a, uh, like, like a megaphone. Uh, he had a big prairie voice. And he's standing on the edge of the platform, and he knew about the assassination attempts, the rumors, and so did the, the general of the army, and, and this is uh, Scott, General Winfield Scott. And General Winfield Scott had drawn up cannon in front of the inaugural platform. And there were, there were, there were snipers, uh, there were riflemen posted in the windows and on the rooftops just kind of scanning the crowd. And I'll imagine that, that you're the President of the United States, you know the rumors, they're all over the, you know, the, the bar rooms, I mean, they're all over the, uh, you know, the, 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 the hotels that Lincoln will not live to finish that speech. And I'm standing on the edge of the platform, and there were cannon drawn up, and I can see the sentries, not the guards, rather, in the windows scanning the crowd, and I'm here. I've got no protective glass. There's no bulletproof vest on me. And the word is, I'm not going to finish the speech alive. St uh, Douglas, Frederick Stephen Douglas, who was there, didn't think Lincoln would finish it alive either. Absolutely convinced of it. But he did. He did. 
We've got seven states out of the union. And then the tug comes. I will defend federal property. Didn't say where, didn't say how, didn't say to what extent, but that telegram arrives. Now let me stop for a minute here. Uh, where can I help you out here a little bit if, you need, if we need to sort out the narrative? Any, anything at all? We've got Lincoln elected. We have his position on slavery. We have the Confederacy established. Oh, and by the way, such irony. The, if you read the Confederate Constitution, it prohibits secession. <laughs> once you join, you're in. Great, isn't it? You may not secede once you've joined. Perfect. How predictable. Yes? Um, you did answer the question, but I'm still, um, I never can quite get it straight when the Republican and Democratic, well, you explained the Democratic Party, but I was under the impression that the Republican values actually switched. When? Um, later. That the, the Republican Party at that time, yeah. it was the party of, it, it was the party of high tariffs to protect industry. It was the party of progress, the, the transcontinental railroad. It was the party of funding agricultural and mining colleges. It was uh, colleges rather. It was the party of the future, the party of progress. The, Demo the, the first democratic party of, the, of that 19th century was the party of slavery, states' rights, unlimited government, low taxes, and a minimalist presidency. Is that what you're referring to? I mean, this was a party, the Republican Party was a party of the future a party of business, a party of develop the Homestead Act, get the country moving west. I mean, that's, I mean, that's on the, the Lincoln Watch, the Homestead Act, you know, that you know, go west, young man, go west, and bring your women with you, and a rifle, because we're not exactly welcomed, are we? That's another whole story, isn't it? And, and that's, a, that, that's another, we could always put more guns in the street, you know, than the, uh, than the natives. At that time, there were 30, 33. There were 33. 33. Oh, Almost evenly divided between slave state and free state, 33. Okay. And since you brought it up, you just threw a switch in my head. No, no, you just threw a switch. That when new flags were ordered for the country during the, during the war, then Lincoln was asked, should we delete the Confederate states and reduce, and reduce the number by, well, eventually 12. And Lincoln said, absolutely not. Do not reduce the number of stars in the flag. That, if you will, is a sign that I'm accepting some sort of defeat or some sort of compromise. And by the way, I mean, we are safely here in, in the People's Republic of Massachusetts, so we can use the phrase civil war, can't we? But if you're in Virginia, or you're in, you're in Kentucky, you're in Virginia, you would better use the phrase the war between the states. You would better use that phrase. Otherwise, you're going to wind up with flat tires. And if you're deep into the South, if you're in Mississippi burning, if you're deep in the South, you had better use the phrase, the war of northern aggression. We left peaceably, and, 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 and you guys followed us. You started it, and we just tried to, we had to defend ourselves. The war of northern aggression. We left peaceably and you try to coerce us, and that's the phrase, try to coerce us, that's their verb, not mine, you know, back into the Union. And they saw the attack on Fort Sumter as coercion, that's where we're going right now. Lincoln had just been sworn in, and he hadn't even met his cabinet yet, and a, a, a telegram thumps into his inbox, and it's from Major Robert Anderson at Fort Sumter, and he's asking, you know, I, I need supplies. Now, where's Fort Sumter? It's in, it's in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, isn't it? A state that's left the Union, the first state out. And there's a Yankee fort with a Yankee flag and Yankee soldiers in our sovereign state of South Carolina, which is no longer part of the United States of America. We are now part of the Confederate States of America. And that guy wants to do business with our merchants in Charleston because he's running out of food. And we've said no. And he sends that cable to Lincoln. What should I do? You know, should I strike the colors? Should I lower the flag? What should I do? 
I'm, I'm running out of food. I've only got about 80 men here. And they got a lot more than that looking right at me. I'm looking right down the barrel of a cannon, lots of cannon, and they're all trained on me. What say you, Mr. President? And Lincoln calls his cabinet in. Guys, I got this telegram. What's your best thinking on this? And Winfield Scott, who was the general in chief of the United States Army, uh, he said, abandon the fort. Don't pick a fight now. Abandon the fort. Let things cool down. And Lincoln, you know, if, you read the, if, if you read Lincoln's first inaugural, if you, if you lo read the closing paragraph, I mean, he's, he, he, he tells his listeners that you could, if you want war, you have to start it. See, he believed they're just angry, and they'll come back in. You know, when they settle down and realize what they've done, and that I'm not coming after them, they'll calm down and they'll be home. I mean, in effect, that last paragraph of, the, of that inaugural, in effect, says I'm leaving the lights on, the front door's open, and I'll put a, a meal up for you in the refrigerator. Get home here. Get home. And I'm not going to ask where you've been, who you've, who you've been with, or what you've been up to. Get home. Now, some historians would argue that Lincoln was naive. He was hopeful that this thing would not disintegrate into war. On my watch, I've given you the best I can do. Trust me. We don't believe you. So now I've got this telegram from Major Anderson and, and Winfield Scott, a Virginian. Winfield Scott tells him, abandon the fort. We can't protect it. You, know, you need to get your administration together. You need to find out where the men's room is. You need to let the country settle down. And, and Lincoln's thinking, is he speaking to me as a West Point graduate, duty on a country? Or is he speaking to me as a Virginian? Where's he coming from in this? I mean, Lincoln's, Lincoln is surrounded by sharks. He hasn't met these people. And then from William Seward of New York, you know, whom he appointed as Secretary of State, you know, bring my enemies in. And, and Seward also, Mr. President, abandon the fort. We can't defend it. Pick your fight somewhere else. And Lincoln is thinking, is he telling me this because he believes it? Or, is he, or is, this, is he sour grapes because he did not get the nomination and he's hoping that I fail and maybe that'll open it up for him, you know, in, in 1864. Maybe that'll open up for him if I resign. And at one time, the order of secession to the presidency, once you got past the, past the VP, you know, went through the cabinet. And, and he is the primus inter pares, first among equals in the cabinet because of the order of creation of cabinet positions, in terms of their longevity. Where's he coming from? Where's the army coming from? And Lincoln. Lincoln played a cool game here. Lincoln, Lincoln, I am going to, and Lincoln thought this through, and he baited South Carolina. I mean, one way to put it, one way to put it, one way to think about it, is that Lincoln starts a war. Lincoln starts a war. He sends a telegram to Governor Pickens of South Carolina that he gives them the date, April 12th, April 14th, whatever the date was, that I'm sending ships to, to supply ships, supply ships to Fort Sumter, food for hungry men. There will be no troops. There'll be no, no armament. There'll be no gunpowder. There'll, there'll be no cannon. I'm sending food to hungry men. I said I would defend federal property, and I will. Now, when Governor Pickens gets this telegram, I don't want to start anything here. You know, if I let those ships resupply the fort, it'll take the wind out of our sails as an independent country. That's a Yankee fort in our nation, in my, in my harbor. That makes a mockery out of our independency. It's an invasion. But I'm not going to make that call. I don't make that kind of money. That's above my pay grade. So he sends that down to Montgomery, Alabama, and bang, that lands in the inbox of Jeff Davis. And Jefferson Davis, a West Pointer. Jefferson Davis, who never wanted to be president of the Confederacy. He wanted a field command. And, and by the way, never wanted his citizenship back. Never. Never wanted it back. And, 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 we, and I know this, we know this, all you need to do is look at the title page or the inside page of his memoirs 
about the Civil War. And in that little, it's, it's a note to us, it's a note to posterity. He said, I regret nothing. I regret nothing. I would do it all over again. And Jimmy Carter, I'm taking a side trip here, folks. Jimmy Carter pardoned him right before he left office in 1979 and restored Jefferson Davis' citizenship. Now, I know when Jimmy Carter gets off the elevator on the other side of the stars, Jefferson Davis is going to be waiting for him to give him a big fat lip. I never wanted my citizen, citizenship back. I regret nothing. I would do it all over again. That's quite a statement, isn't it? So Jeff Davis says, bang, it's in Jefferson Davis. It's in his box, and he knows. If I let those ships resupply the fort, that makes, makes a mockery out of independence. You have invaded the Confederacy. You have reestablished your claim to, to, this, to this land, and we are no longer part of the United States of America. So he tells Pickens, attack the fort. Attack the fort at dawn. The, Lincoln is telling me three supply ships are going to arrive on this date. Attack, attack the fort at first light, when your artillery guys can get a good shot at the fort. And the man in charge, the man, this is, again, this, 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 the war between the states, uh, it, it's so personal, that the man in charge, the, the General P.G.T. Beauregard, was in charge of the, of the Confederate cannon at Fort, at Fort Sumter. And now Fort Sumter is enclosed on three sides by the harbor. It's there to defend the, the harbor from an attack by the British. So it's nestled inside the harbor. I mean, you know, here's the harbor and here's Fort Sumter. And Beauregard is instructed at first light to reduce the fort to rubble. And Beauregard, Major Anderson, Major Anderson was my artillery instructor at West Point. He's in that fort. And I was one of his prized pupils. He asked me to stay on after I graduated to help instruct new pupils, the, ple the plebes, in how to handle artillery, to, to, to sight it, elevation, windage, and so forth. That's my teacher out there. That's my professor out there. I don't want to attack him. I don't want to attack him. I, he's my professor. He's my teacher. So he rode out there. He rode out there. He said, Major Anderson, I have my orders to attack you in the morning. I don't want to do this. You've been asked to leave the fort, and you have my word as a man, you have my word as an officer, that you will be allowed to leave this fort peaceably and, 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 and unharmed and return to the north. But I have orders in the, in the morning to attack you. And Anderson, I have orders to defend the fort, to hold until relieved, you know, and not to, not to surrender the fort and not to lower the flag. I have my orders too. And we have the attack at Fort Sumter. And depending on what side of the, uh, the aisle you're on, Lincoln starts a war, or Lincoln is making good on a campaign, making good on an inaugural, on an inaugural pledge that I will not give up, I will defend American property. Because what was going on, he knew this, you know, what was going on in the South is, you know, when that building said USA, you know, or that ship said USA, all you need to do is take the U and flip it, and it's a C. Now it's the Confederate States, and he knew that was going on. I'm defending Fort Sumter. God help me. I said I would do it, and I'm going to do it. And it was about a 32-hour barrage, and that fort was reduced brick by brick. It was a, there was not a single casualty, death, death, during the bombardment. It was almost a bloodless opening. There were a couple of horses that were killed. It was almost a bloodless opening, you know, to the bloodiest war in, in American history. And even today, historians still debate, military um, uh, historians still debate the number of deaths and overall casualties. The number keeps expanding because no one knows. 30% of the of Northerners never showed up, they never came home. Where did they go? They're dead somewhere, in an unmarked grave, in a, you know, in, a, in a forest, you know, next to a swamp, who knows? So those numbers continue to, uh, to grow. Today the number is at 750,000 dead. Now that includes you know, deaths from disease and 
and infections because there's no, there's no penicillin. I mean, there's no, there are no antibiotics. And, and for, for a surgeon, for a surgeon, it was off with the limb, wasn't it? A good surgeon could get an arm off in seven seconds. A good surgeon could get a leg off in 12, se 12 seconds. And depending on how far up it was to the torso, that increased the, the, the odds of an infection, sepsis, and death. So I'll just leave that you know, right there for now. So Lincoln, you know, the war was on. The ships were driven off, by the way. Uh, they saw the bombardment, and, and they were driven off. And Anderson is allowed to leave with his troops under a flag of truce, and he takes the flag with him. The flag that had been flying over Fort Sumter, he lowers it. It's all tattered and, 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 and riddled with shot and shell and shrapnel, and he folds it carefully and sticks it in his knapsack. Back then they're called haversacks. He stuck it in his knapsack. And he will run that same flag up when the, when the war ends. And Lincoln's invited to be there. And Lincoln said, no, I have tickets to Ford's Theater. He should have been at Fort Sumter, the raising of the flag, this very same flag that was lowered in April of 1861. You can't make that stuff up. Even Walt Disney can't make that stuff up or Spielberg can't make that stuff up. It's true, too good to be true, but it's true. You heard it from me, it's true. So the war is on and Lincoln, Lincoln and his generals expect a short war. Now there'll be one battle. It'll be a short war. It'll be over 90 days, 90 days. Uh, there'll be one battle and it'll, it'll be over. And that'll be enough. It's like two kids in the schoolyard you know, fighting for about 30 seconds and the teacher comes in and separates them. But nobody's lost their pride. I mean, no, no, nobody's gone down. And, and but, uh, so it'll be, it'll be over 90 days. Lincoln does not have an army. The army, it's a small army of 14,000. They're on the plains chasing Cochise. Uh, you know, we, we don't have an army. And General Winfield Scott, who is a very seasoned warrior now at 74, and he was a brilliant soldier during the Mexican-American War, but he's grown fat, he weighs 300 pounds. He's grown, he's, in fact, he's so heavy that when he reviews the troops, he can't lift himself up, his foot in the stirrup and swing himself over the back of the horse. He has to be winched up and then lowered on the horse. Pity the horse. So he's become fat and bloated, certainly does not wear the uniform, with distinction as he once did, but he still has, he's still sentient. And his advice to Lincoln, 90 days, 90 days, no way. Three years, three years. We have to invade and hold an area the size of, of, of Western Europe. And, and also, you know, making that an area the size of Western Europe is with the attack on Fort Sumter, four more states leave the Union. Yeah, and we, you know, we've got, uh, Virginia's out, Winfield Scott State. You know, Virginia's out, North Carolina, Arkansas, Tennessee, Bolt. Now we're up to 11. And there are four more slave states that are in the Union still. Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware. We tend to forget that Delaware was a slave state as well. And as Lincoln always said, I hope that God is on my side, but I have to have Kentucky. If Kentucky goes, that brings the, the border of the Confederacy right up to the Ohio River, a, a natural geographic division. And I need to be careful here. And, and we had, well, uh, we, we had two wars. I mean, there was a guerrilla war in, in Kentucky, a guerrilla war in Missouri. That was nasty and bloody. A guerrilla war within a war between the states. And, and now I've got four more states out of the Union. And I think I can, and Winfield Scott is telling me, you need a professional army. We, what Lincoln had done, Lincoln had called upon the states to send volunteers, a state militia, the National Guard, to send volunteers. It'll be over 90 days. So sign up for 90 days. So when is this? This is May, April, May, June, July. It'll be over by July. And we need to have the big fight in July, and it'll be over. And there's your first bull run. I'll come right back to that. And, and Winfield Scott, you will need to invade. You will need 300,000 men for three years. 
You're going to have to bisect the Confederacy, in other words, sail down the Mississippi River, divide the Confederacy, land on both the east and west side of the Mississippi River, and attack, inter attack internally. You're going to need a blockade from Virginia to the Gulf of Mexico. This is going to be big. And, and he was run out of town. You old goose. You're 70 years old. Man, it's time for you to retire. It's time for you to retire and collect Social Security. I made that up. It's time for you to retire and, 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 and put in for, uh, you know, for Medicare. You're an old goat. You've been around too long. Three years, 300,000 men. My, it's time for you to go. And the man who's selling that and will become Lincoln's first commander, whom he will fire, will be George B. McClellan. And, and being interviewed by Lincoln, boy, he knew how to interview. He could really interview. And Mr. President, I can do it all. That guy is one old goat. And I'm young at 35, 36, whatever. And I can do it all. And I can be commander both of the entire Union Army and command both the, the Eastern Theater, you know, which is east of the Appalachian Mountains, and then the Western Theater, you know, everything west of the Appalachian Mountains down to, down to Kentucky, um, Texas. I can do it all. And McClellan gets the job shortly. But first we have the first battle of Bull Run. And everybody expects it'll be over in July of 1861. There is one howl of patriotism from the North. Men were crawling up each other's backs to enlist, to have the experience. The phrase was to see the elephant. That means combat. And, and, and to be part of this, the camaraderie, to wear the uniform, to march in good order, to be brave, to be bold, gallantry, and maybe even to get a medal. Guys die for a piece of tin, don't they? Even to get a medal. And there, the only medal that was available was the Purple Heart. Uh, that was from Washington. And, and if you notice, if you look up military decorations, the number of men who awarded the, the Congressional Medal of Honor so, wow, well, it was the only medal for gallantry. Um, the Purple Heart is a wound, as opposed to you know, taking a platoon and, and capturing Confederate artillery. So when you see that, so, wow, well, it's the only medal for gallantry. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a period right here. This is a good spot to stop first bull run, July 1861. And it is, a con it is absolutely clearly a Confederate victory. They hold the high ground and, the, and the, the Fed's fleet. And that changes the whole flow of Lincoln's thinking and the war on the ground. And that's when McClellan from New Jersey, I believe. McClellan, yes, he was from New Jersey. I can do it all. I'm the guy. And Lincoln, what an interview. And look at the way he fills out that uniform, broad shoulder, and that authoritative command voice, and that bristling red hair. He looks good. He stands well. He salutes crisply. Lincoln had no military experience whatsoever. He, I thought you were slapping a mosquito, because that's where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Lincoln, Lincoln's only, and he admitted to this. I mean, Lincoln had to learn everything. He was a fast learner, quick learner. He said, I, I participated in the Black Hawk War in, Chicago, in, in Illinois. He said, and I, all, I, I did, all I did was slap mosquitoes. He said, I, I've never seen any, any action. He was green, green. Everybody was green, and no one knew what was coming. No one expected that. It's like when you say, I do. You never know what's coming. Huh? Uh-oh, right? I didn't, I didn't raise my hand for this. So McClellan and Lincoln sold on McClellan. You, you've been run out of Bull Run, and you're damn lucky. The Confederates didn't attack the Capitol. They would have carried it. They would, and the only reason they didn't carry the Capitol is because it rained. It thundered and lightning. It poured, and it turned, it turned the roads into swamps. No army could move. But I can do it all. You can count on me. I'm a leader. 
I'm decisive. I get results. I'm General George B. McClellan. What do you want? <laughs> Didn't he appoint McClellan path to Bull Run? Oh, yes, he did. And who was the general that... At Bull Run? Yeah. Yeah, his name was um, McClure, Bull McLeod, McDow McDow McDowell, General McDowell. McDowell. And McDowell had no experience. Go ahead. Former guy came back and won that battle. He was there. Stonewall Jackson was there. Beauregard was there. Now, the second bull run. First bull run was more decisive than the second bull run. Uh, Beauregard was there. Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Dav Davis came up because the, the capital was moved after Sumter. You know, and when Virginia joined the, uh, joined the Confederacy, they moved the capital from Montgomery to Richmond. Uh, better accommodations, better restaurants, whatever. And, 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 and what that did, is that and, that, and that helped to dictate the axis of the war in the East. You see, the Richmond and, and Washington were only about 125 miles apart. So that tended to dictate you know, the axis of the war. On to Richmond, on to Richmond. McClellan, on to Richmond, when I get an army together. And, and Lincoln knew that the capital was, could have been taken. And, and, and he would have had to relocate the capital. And the, the thought was, we may have to relocate it to Philadelphia. Or the, or the very first capital, New York. But it didn't. And if Maryland left the Union, Maryland surrounds Washington on three sides. He would have had to have abandoned the capital. And the only reason Maryland did not secede, the votes were there to secede. And the only reason that Maryland did not secede from the Union is that the governor of Maryland was a Unionist and he refused to call the, the Maryland legislature into session so they could vote secession because he knew that's where the vote is going. And Lincoln hanging on by a fingernail, Governor, don't call this legislature into session. They will vote out. Then I've got to move out. And I don't know where, I don't have the phone number of the Mayflower Moving Company. And, and so this Lincoln in 1863, and I'm going to leave it right there. So come back in October. Whenever, whenever it is. We should do this tomorrow. Just keep it rolling. I mean, really. I mean, that's the beauty of doing a 15-week course. You meet every week or you meet twice a week. Bang, 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 bang. You know, and that way you get it done. You stitch it all together. And, and irony is the, the Confederate, ca the, the Union Capitol, the, the dome was still under construction, wasn't it? And, and now we have a broken Union and we have the, the dome buck naked. You just see the skeleton of it. And the construction continued on that. And Lincoln, we're going to put we are going to keep 33 stars in the flag. And I hope that God is on my side. But I have to have Kentucky. If I lose Kentucky, the board, the board of the Confederacy nestles right up against the Ohio River, a natural point of separation. Thank you for your company. Thank I'll you. see you later than sooner. But that's OK. All right, bring a friend. Bring a friend. Bring a rebel friend. Because I need to know, is this a union camp or a rebel camp? <laughs>